The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 2049 in the name of Marie Todd on Scotland's climate targets. The debate will be concluded without any questions. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Marie Todd to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is the first time I've had an opportunity to open a member's business debate since being elected in May. Climate change is one of the defining issues of our age. Although there may still be some doubters, the vast majority agree with the science. Just this morning, one of my staff texted me to say, it's the middle of December, it's 12 degrees in Shetland. I rest my case on climate change. <laughs> this subject is a priority for me and it's vital to communities across the region that I represent. There are few nations that could claim to have embraced renewable energy with as much enthusiasm and success as Scotland. The Highlands and Islands, which I represent, is a rich source of renewable energy potential. Our seas contain half the UK's tidal resource and a quarter of the tidal resource in Europe. They also contain about 10% of Europe's total wave resource. We have it all. We have plenty of wind all year round, onshore and off, and long days of sunlight on those few days that the wind might not be blowing. Renewables are a major source of in industrial work in the Highlands and a help to sustain economic growth and employment. And Scotland has the potential to be a world leader in this industry. And because of the ambition and commitment of the Scottish Government, we are well on the way to being one. In the last decade alone, the total output of renewable energy has more than doubled and more than half of Scotland's electricity needs now come from new renewables. The Highlands and Islands are home to a number of leading pro projects in renewable energy. In Orkney, the world's largest tidal turbine, I'm always finding that tricky to say, began trials in August. And in Shetland, power was exported to the grid for the first time from a pair of tidal devices. The world's largest tidal stream array project, Maygen, is in the Pentland Firth and Burradale Wind Farm in Shetland holds the world record for the highest capacity of a wind farm. Making full use of our abundant natural resources will boost the region, but good stewardship will also be vital. We live in a stunningly beautiful part of the country with abundant wildlife, so of course we need to be careful and assess the impact of harnessing these assets. With care and good science, we can do that. We all agree that a step change in our ability to generate low carbon electricity is required and large scale projects like the Beatrice Wind Farm in the Murray Firth will generate jobs at NIG and boost the economy as well as contributing to that step change. Make no mistake, the greatest threat to our wildlife today is climate change. It's climate change which threatens our wildlife, not renewable projects which is why the charities who commissioned this report are so supportive of renewable energy development. In terms of moving beyond renewable electricity, the Highlands and Islands have some really exciting projects in heat generation and in energy storage. In Shetland, Star Renewables is investing in renewable heat energy with loan funding from the Scottish Government. They're developing plans to add a, a large-scale seawater source a heat pump, which will help to expand an existing ditch district heating network. Thurso is home to the UK's largest lithium iron cell manufacturing plant, AGM Batteries Limited. With other Scottish partners, it's creating the next generation of battery technologies for electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. And in Orkney, a hydrogen project is using tidal and wind power to produce fuel for the local ferry fleet. In the first phase, a harbour-based fuel cell will provide overnight power to the inter-island ferries, replacing diesel generation. Of course, fuel poverty is such a significant issue in the Highlands and Islands. We have lots of organisations working on energy efficiency too, including the Kyle of Sutherland Development Trust, which have been working with Scottish Gas, um, advising people on energy efficiency. Improving energy efficiency and decarbonising energy is particularly challenging in rural areas. And given the scale of the problem of fuel poverty in my region, it's absolutely essential that any government policy does nothing to worsen this situation. Scottish renewable businesses are exporting their innovations globally, working in more than 40 countries around the world. 
in every continent except Antarctica, which is something we can all be really proud of. An example of this, again from my own constituency, is the European Marine Energy Centre based in Orkney. They've just been called upon for development of a wave and tidal energy industry in Nagasaki in Japan. But there is growing concern in the industry that without enough support we'll start to fall behind other world leaders. Recently, I spoke with Gareth Davis, the managing director in Aquaterra, an Orkney-based company which has been involved in the creation of marine energy projects in the United States, Chile, Japan, Colombia, Peru, in Indonesia, all from the highlands and islands. And I'm quoting Gareth directly. Having seen the UK give away its leadership and ownership of wind technology, we said we wouldn't repeat the same mistake again. Yet the UK is setting itself on a pathway to do just the same with marine energy. The UK has learned so much, achieved so much, and benefited so much. Yet Canada, France, and Southeast Asia, Japan, and China are set to reap the longer term benefits. They say to make a mistake once is forgivable. To do the same again is stupidity. Orkney companies have travelled to over 20 countries around the world in the last nine months, seeking out work and opportunities to keep their staff in Orkney employed into the future. This is a direct impact of the UK government's failure to set a fair and reasonable CFD framework for marine energy and island wind. We can't afford to give away our position of leadership in the marine energy industry. To sum up, I welcome this report it's a really valuable contribution to the debate. I know that the Scottish Government is carrying out its own detailed research to assess how best to achieve carbon reduction targets at the lowest cost to the economy. And I look forward to the publication of the draft Energy Strategy and Climate Change Plan in January. The Scottish Government's record speaks for itself. And under the First Minister's leadership, I know that the ambition remains high. That's why we're already committed to introducing a new climate change bill with higher targets. Ambitious targets have helped to drive innovation in the past, and I want to see ambitious targets drive them into the future. Thank you. Speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, Morris Golden, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'd like to congratulate Marie Todd on securing this debate. Climate change is a great challenge of our times. It is a threat that affects us all, and it is a fight that requires a global response. I am proud that Scotland is playing her part. As ever, we are punching above our weight, and we are seeing some progress for our efforts. Emissions have reduced, down almost a half since 1990, allowing Scotland's annual target to be met for the first time with significant progress in the electricity and waste sectors. Alongside this reduction has been the Scottish renewables revolution. Take 2014, for example. Low carbon renewables accounted for almost 40% of Scotland's electricity, the highest anywhere in the UK. And Scotland led the rest of Britain by producing almost a third of its renewable energy. Last year, the figures continued to improve, with more than half of Scotland's electricity consumption coming from renewables. This is to be welcomed. These successes should be recognised, but much more remains to be done. With 2020 fast approaching, it is only right that we lift our gaze towards 2030. Looking towards the next decade, there is much for Scotland to contend with in moving towards a low carbon economy. Transport emissions account for more than a quarter of all Scottish emissions, and the dial has barely moved since 1990 in reducing them. The good news <coughs> is that the tools <coughs> there are for us to use uh, are here. Urban consolidation hubs, electric vehicles, better public transport and cycle superhighways. We must get serious on transport emissions if we are to continue to meet our targets, affect positive change and see emissions fall further. How we heat our homes is another issue hovering on the horizon. Heating consumed more than half of Scotland's energy output in 2014. Yet barely more than 5% of heating consumption was met by renewables last year. 
It is not more warm words from all of us that we need to heat our homes, but efficient, low-carbon heating networks. And I recognise the pioneering work of Star Renewables, based in Thornley Bank in the west of Scotland, the region which I represent. Underpinning much of this is the need to be more energy efficient. Simply put, the most environmentally friendly energy is the energy that isn't used at all. Our struggle against climate change will be made all the easier by investment in upgrading our homes to at least an EPC C rating. This will also help the poorest in our society to get out of fuel poverty. So, progress has been made, but the task is far from finished. We must continue to make the case to protect our environment, cre create opportunities for businesses, and allow Scotland the chance to lead the rest of the United Kingdom. Let's make that case, let's look to 2030, and let's put our words into action. Claudia Beamish, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you to Marie Todd for bringing this debate to the Chamber and to Ricardo Energy and Environment, uh, WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth Scotland and RSPB Scotland for their collaborative work on the Energy of Scotland report. The report does indeed echo Scottish Labour's 2016 manifesto promise an aspiration to generate 50% of electricity, heat and transport demand from renewables by 2030. If we meet this target, we will be contributing robustly to meeting the future climate change targets, and the report gives guidance on how to do so in a just and cost-optimal way. Our current trajectory suggests missed targets in the distant future. Policies are simply too timid and progress too slow for some sectors, for instance, heat. I am passionate about democratic ownership uh, as a model for energy, and I want to focus on two examples from my own region, then look to Europe and ask the Minister um, a question at the end, I hope, if I get that far in four minutes. In my region of South Scotland, and, and the Ministers as well, Gala Water and the, and the Mill Laid Society in the Scottish borders are in the early stages of restoring sites in the Victorian Galashiels water uh, lades to generate electricity through low head hydro technology. The project will develop a wealth of benefits to the town, including opportunities for community shares, connecting the community with energy generation and reinvigorating that part of uh, a part of the, the town's history. It would be a great trailblazer for other lades investing in hydro in Scotland. And another positive story from the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme can be found in Estelle Muir. The Upper Estelle Development Group is a community organisation working on regenerating the village primary school, installing high quality insulation, air source heat pumps, installing hot, and also a solar PV installation kit. The emission savings over 15 years um, will earn the group £2,500 a year, as well as a significant amount of CO2 to savings, a win-win situation. Last year, last week rather, <laughs> time moves too fast. Uh, last week I attended a conference in Brussels focusing on just transition to the low carbon economy. Of course, the development of transferable skills and the pay and conditions of workers in the burgeoning renewable sector is part of this fair way forward. Another aspect of a just transition is fairness for communities. And the Scottish Government and councils such as Edinburgh have supported community and cooperative ownership and involvement in sustainable energy through funding and advice. On the European mainland, this is sometimes termed energy democracy. There are many different models of community involvement, some more participatory than others. In Helsinki, the municipality has Finland's largest solar power plant hosted on the roof of a ski hall, whatever that is, and local residents can, I quote, order their own uh, designated panels so that they can benefit from solar energy without having to make large investments. And the mayor of the Pamplona uh, City Council states, I believe that people and communities should have the right to control their energy future. And he argues for more social justice and empowering people to be more than passive consumers. Can I ask the Minister to tell the Chamber in his closing remarks what research gathering capacity the Scottish Government has to collect and analyse information 
from Europe and beyond as we develop our own vision for an energy strategy which is as inclusive as possible. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, presiding officer, may I start by wishing you a happy birthday um, and uh, thank uh, Marie Todd uh, for securing this debate. It's always as well to get credit in with the presiding officer. It's just one of the rules uh, in this place. Um, let me also say that uh, I find myself agreeing with every single word that Morris Golden said. I think it was a very uh, worthwhile contribution. I just gently encourage him and his Conservative uh, colleagues, perhaps, in the light of that agreement, perhaps to consider signing the motion uh, from time to time, even if there's an SNP name on it. But that's a political point, not particularly to be stressed. The key point is that uh, the report that's the subject of today's debate makes a lot of critical points, They're critical to our economy, to renewable energy, uh, and fundamentally to climate change. Members will of course know of my uh, personal engagement as the Minister for Climate Change who took uh, the bill through in 2009. Very challenging bill, and I think it's fair to acknowledge that one of the areas that's already been uh, a subject to debate is one of the areas where the challenge is greatest, and that's heat, renewable heat. Uh, it's proving f fundamentally more difficult than I think we imagined in 2009. But that doesn't mean we should ignore it because it's difficult. On the contrary, it is the difficult things to which we must now uh, turn our attention. But we do so based on the successes we've had in other areas. Transport remains difficult, I absolutely accept. Uh, let me just tell you a little story on that one. When I was minister, I went to the uh, eco-congregations uh, meeting. It was in a rural area. We had people from all over Scotland who were enthusiasts uh, for making groups of uh, faith, faith groups uh, more ecologically friendly. Um, I found uh, a ready uh, ear for the things I had to say and then I made the mistake of saying those of us like myself who live in a rural area perhaps in transport uh, one of the things we might think about doing is just coordinating with our neighbours our visits uh, to the local towns to do our shopping. I can only describe what happened as all Hades broke loose. I use the word carefully presiding officer um, because it turned out that even in the most enthusiastic climate change adopters, um, it to some extent was for everyone else to do, not for them. And I think that's the big challenge. The challenge lies with the people and our persuading people uh, to, to, to new ways of working. Now, the UK has been doing reasonably well uh, in the rankings, although it's going a little bit backwards at the moment. Scotland is uh, a 700th of the world's emissions, uh, and I think it's broadly recognised as being uh, one of the, the, the leaders. Um, albeit, there are other areas of the world where, in certain respects, uh, they're doing better to us. The leadership that, that we've displayed, I think, uh, is being challenged by some of the policies on renewable energy uh, from the UK. But I have hopes, because I think there is economic benefit uh, from addressing climate change. We create new jobs, uh, we reduce our long-term costs, because after all, the raw material for renew uh, renewable energy is all but free once you've made the capital investment. And I think these are all things uh, which we can all look at and hope that we can uh, move forward on. For Scotland, of course, we have engineering skills, particularly in relation to offshore installations, that we can leverage across from our oil and gas industries into new offshore renewable energies. First mover advantage is still there for us uh, to grasp. I hope that uh, this debate is a useful contribution, just as the paper we're discussing today and the work of WWF Friends of Earth and RSPB has made a very excellent contribution uh, to the issue of climate change. I look forward to listening to my colleagues' contributions. Presiding officer, once again, happy birthday. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I've got Mark Ruskell to be followed by, you've got me all confused now, Ruth McGuire. Um, Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Can I associate myself with the celebratory remarks from Stuart Stevenson? I'm not going to sing happy birthday to you, perhaps in this chamber, but maybe later. Um, and can I also declare an interest as a sterling councillor? 
Um, now, it's the second time in two weeks that we've debated the future direction of our energy policy and the importance of an all-energy target that encompasses heat, transport, and electricity. Um, there's a lot to unpack in this debate ahead of the launch of the energy strategy and the revised climate program early next year. So can I thank Marie Todd for giving us all some welcome extra space to do that. Now, I very much welcome the Energy of Scotland report produced by the environmental NGOs. I think it reinforces the separate work conducted by Scottish Renewables earlier this year, which also concluded that an all-energy target of 50% by 2030 was a desirable yet achievable stretch target. Now, setting such a target would provide confidence and certainty in the way that our early targets on renewable electricity did for industry. But, of course, targets on their own are not enough, and I accept the points raised by the Minister in last week's debate that research is required surrounding the implementation of such a target. But I would hope that with the final touches, hopefully, being made to the energy strategy, that we would be nearing the end of that process rather than being stuck at the beginning. And there is, of course, an element of chicken and egg. Set a target, then innovation research development will flow, provided there's the right regulatory planning fiscal regimes to underpin it. Don't set a target, and the direction of travel is too uncertain for investment. And, of course, we have a fantastic research base in Scotland, and I pay tribute to organisations such as SMRU Consulting in St Andrews, who've developed over many years a strong reputation globally for high-quality marine mammal research. And it's the work of organisations like SMRU that can unlock barriers to progress and allow ambitious targets to take off, I think especially within the marine sector, which Marie Todd has already um, pointed out is a vitally important sector that we don't lose the lead over. Um, but we should also recognise that innovation and research can also take place at a community level. And I think Claudia Beamish has already um, mentioned some excellent examples from the south of Scotland. There are some great examples of projects and approaches that have been developed over the last decade. And I'd like to pay tribute to Fintry Development Trust in my own region. Their work, Trailblazing, one of the first joint ventures between a wind farm developer and a community, was a long and at times a painful journey, but its success in, has inspired many other community renewables groups around Scotland. Fintry's grown into a local energy system laboratory over the years, using the profits earned from the wind on the hill to reinvest in energy efficiency advice and renewable installations in the home. And in fact, if you look at the weekly planning schedules for Stirling Council, as I do most weeks, there are fresh applications for air source heat pumps and biomass boilers and everything else every single week. The rollout of those embedded renewables in homes and businesses has been phenomenal. But they've now gone a lot further, piloting Electric Car Club, bringing a biomass fuel district heating scheme to a residential caravan park, and developing one of the first schemes in the UK that will take electricity produced by AD at a small dairy and sell it directly cons to consumers under a local tariff. So grid constraints, financial constraints, fuel poverty, and the need to build social capital in our communities can all be strong drivers towards the local energy systems of the future. And I hope that the forthcoming energy strategy will recognize the huge potential of the role of social enterprises in delivering much more than just heat and light to consumers. And absolutely the point raised by Claudia Beamish, we need an energy democracy, an energy, energy vendor, as they say, in Germany. How the utilities and Ofgem can learn from these non-traditional business models will be important as we move towards a more decentralized and embedded energy system. We also need to consider how de-risking the development process for communities and allowing them greater access to assets such as land can help them get a foothold in the energy marketplace. Presiding Officer Ofgem, I've already visited Fintry on a number of occasions and I'd like to conclude by inviting the Minister to join me on a visit when time allows to see the multiple joined up approaches and benefits. There's also a community owned pub. <laughs> Ruth McGuire to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin by congratulating my colleague Marie Todd on bringing her first member's debate on the very important subject of Scotland's climate change targets to the Chamber. Like colleagues, I would also like to welcome the report by WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth Scotland and RSPB Scotland and its motivating findings about the potential of our renewable energy resources. As we all know, Scotland has been blessed with fantastic renewable energy potential, home, for example, to around a quarter of Europe's offshore wind resource. Not only that, but we've made tremendous strides in harnessing it, establishing our nation as an international example, indeed an inspiration when it comes to renewable energy. 
This year, for the first time ever, wind turbines in Scotland generated more electricity than we used in the whole of the nation on a single day. On the whole, Scotland now generates over half of its total electricity use from renewables, a 14% increase on 2014 and representing 26% of the total UK renewable energy that was generated in 2015. Neither is Scotland's prowess in renewables limited to these shores. Recent research has set out how our renewable energy expertise is in demand around the world, with Scottish businesses working in more than 40 countries and in every continent bar Antarctica. Windhoist, a crane company based in my own constituency in Irvine, has installed more than 4,800 wind turbines across the globe, from South Africa and Morocco to Australia and Belgium. Leading by example at home and sharing expertise abroad, our renewable riches allow us to contribute to tackling climate change on a global scale. In addition, our renewables industry provides a valuable source of economic strength and employment. We've heard how figures from the ONS show that low carbon industries and their supply chains in Scotland generated a turnover of almost 11 billion in 2014 and supported 43,500 jobs. My own constituency of Cunningham South is home to renewable energy specialist Prontoport, who supply consultancy, engineering support and maintenance to wind farms across the UK. It consistently achieves turnover in excess of 2 million and employs 45 full-time staff. Prontoport also run a world-class training academy in Irvine, which I recently had the pleasure to visit, and where I saw firsthand their expert training provision in practice. Clearly, great strides have been made and our approach to capitalising on Scotland's renewable energy must continue to be ambitious. The target to meet 100% of our electricity needs from renewables by 2020 fits that bill, as does, our, as does our shared resolve across most of the Chamber to focus efforts on finding ways to convert our heat and transport energy supply to renewables over the years ahead. The suggestion of the report that Scotland has the capacity to produce 50% of all energy from renewables by 2030 is an aspirational one, and we should always set our sights high. Ambition, however, must, must be matched by due diligence, by careful consideration of any unintended drawbacks for our plans and ambitions in other areas, in particular ensuring access to affordable energy and tackling the blight of fuel poverty, an issue which we recently debated here and whose severity was recognised across the Chamber. I support the comments of the Minister that the Government will not set any new targets until it has carried out the necessary research that will underpin them, and indeed given consideration to the potential consequences that our climate change targets have for other important areas. At the same time, I welcome the Minister's indication that close consideration of the report will inform the development of future targets, and I look forward to reading the draft strategy in the early new year. Thank you. I have Liam McCarthy, please, followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you very much. And can I echo uh, Mark Ruskell's uh, approach in, in adopting the same celebratory, if slightly obsequious, tone of uh, Stuart Stevenson and wishing you a, a happy birthday? And can I also congratulate uh, Marie Todd on uh, not just um, securing this debate, but choosing this subject for her, um, uh, her, her inaugural members' debate? It is, as she said, very much um, at the heart of what uh, the Highlands and Islands uh, region is all about. Can I also congratulate WWF and the other, um, uh, the other NGOs involved in the preparation of the, uh, the report, which again, as Mark Ruskell said, echoes some of the findings of the Scottish Renewables report uh, earlier in the year. And I think that 50 per cent target uh, for uh, energy from renewables by 2030 is achievable. I can understand why the Scottish Government needs to, feels the need to, to go through the due diligence, but we are approaching the point where um, I think we will need to, to see the Government uh, show its hand. I think I would urge uh, them to be ambitious in this uh, area. In the renewables debate last week, I was cut off in my prime. An expectant public was denied the benefit of my peroration. Uh, I was also chastised on social media uh, for not necessarily emphasising the job opportunities uh, arising from a commitment uh, to renewables, particularly in relation to manufacturing and the export benefits that arise from that. I wholeheartedly uh, accept that point. The job creating opportunities from a more sustainable use of our resources, I think, is accepted by everyone. The Scottish uh, Renewables Report um, uh, ahead of this debate 
It points to those export opportunities. It points to uh, EMEC and their involvement in projects in, in Japan. It points to um, uh, Scottish Renewables Ambassador Gareth D uh, Davis and his team at Aquaterra and involvement all over the world. But in a sense, that's a reflection of um, the loss of activity and um, the, the reduced confidence that has uh, arisen in recent times uh, through some of the de decisions taken at the uh, UK level. And I would certainly encourage the Scottish Government to step into the space in terms of encouraging innovation. But Stuart Stevenson, again, I think was right in, in, in urging us to turn our attention to the difficult things, and uh, notably in heat and transport, where less progress has been made. Uh, in terms of warm homes bill, I think it provides an opportunity for us to up our game on district heating and um, uh, making good, uh, I think, uh, deficiencies in the private rented sector. But as with um, not just the warm uh, homes bill, but the fuel poverty strategy, possibly even the climate change bill as well, I would again reiterate my plea for a degree of flexibility in allowing local circumstances to be built into the solutions uh, that are used to, to, to drive the achievement of the objectives we set. And in terms of transport, um, I would note in passing um, and again make a, a last-minute plea to the Minister uh, to roll back from uh, the commitment to reduce uh, air passenger uh, duty. But I would use the time left available um, to make a specific plea in relation to electric uh, vehicles. Um, this is again an area where Orkney, I think, um, can lay claim to having the highest number of electric vehicles per head of population anywhere in the country. Uh, I think that the ownership of EVs is going up partly because, uh, or largely because costs are coming down through technology advances, through uh, the, uh, the wider uptake, also through a burgeoning second-hand market, which is bringing down capital costs too. The infrastructure is indeed more extensive, though I think more can be done, and I think I would pay credit to the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum and work they've done in terms of advising local authorities on the optimal siting of, of charge points. Um, but I think it's to the issue of repair and maintenance we really urgently need to turn our attention. Um, the infrastructure is in place, but it's no use if it doesn't work. And too often we're finding people turning up uh, to these charge points only to find them out of order, sometimes for days, often for weeks. And I think the problem is that councils, the manufacturers, the operator charge your car all are pointing the finger of blame at each other. Whether or not there's a, a cost recovery uh, mechanism that would allow uh, the, uh, the, the charge points to be more uh, reliably uh, in working condition, something we expect of petrol stations. We wouldn't accept this uh, were, uh, were petrol stations to be out of order for days or weeks. We can't afford that to happen uh, for uh, re re electric vehicle charge points. In conclusion, I think we've done excellent work um, in, in the field of electricity. That's widely acknowledged. We can do more, but it is in the area of heat and transport we really do need to focus our attention. And I think the role of this parliament is to keep the government's feet to the fire uh, on what I think is a shared ambition. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Ivan McKee to be followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And before I start, I'd just like to remind the parliament of my uh, role as the parliamentary liaison officer to the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work. I also want to thank uh, Marie Todd for bringing this um, important debate to the Parliament. Scotland, as we have uh, recognised, has made tremendous uh, progress in greening our um, energy supply over recent years. In 1996, only 8% of our electricity supply came from renewables, uh, whereas last year, um, a total of uh, 22 gigawatt hours, 57% um, of our electricity supply came from, uh, from renewables. And Scotland currently supplies 26% of the UK's renewable energy, making a significant contribution to the UK's overall climate change targets. The renewable industry, as has been identified, already supports 43,500 jobs in Scotland, and companies in the sector generate uh, almost £11 billion in uh, turnover. Scotland obviously makes good use of its significant natural renewable resources, onshore wind, offshore wind, pump hydro, and working to develop new technologies in wave and tidal, with a total installed capacity at the moment of 8 gigawatts, but the potential to deliver several times that number. So as a consequence, Scotland has exceeded its climate change commitments, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the 1990 baseline level of 77 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent to current levels of 46 million tonnes. And Scotland's performance has been uh, widely recognised and applauded internationally. The challenge to achieve 50% of electricity from renewables has been exceeded, and the next task to reach 100% of electricity from renewables is within our sites. The significant quantity of on and offshore wind generation consented, uh, one gigawatt of uh, pumped hydro capacity ready to go, waiting only on the UK government to provide a route to market. We're well on our way to the next uh, milestone. Beyond that, the challenges to green the rest of the energy mix and transport and heat um, are more difficult. 
together goes accounting for three quarters of our total energy demand. And this report, uh, Renewable Energy in Scotland in 2030, from the WWF, the RSPB, Friends of the Earth, and Ricardo Energy and Environment, gives us confidence in the path to follow to meet this challenge. So the challenge ahead will require a number of uh, technological, economic, cultural, and political barriers to be overcome. Um, and this report makes a significant contribution to the debate around how best to proceed. It portrays a vision of what Scotland's energy supply would look like by 2030. The growth in energy generation from renewables will continue, and by 2030, perhaps 140% of electricity supply coming from renewables, enabling Scotland to export this resource, installing an extra 8 gigawatt of renewable capacity, supporting an extra 14,000 jobs. And the cost of renewable generation continuing to fall through economies of scale and technological advances. Low emission vehicles will become the norm, the proliferation of electric vehicles both for public and tr private transport, and the drop in petrol and diesel use also delivering significant health benefits. Heat provides the most challenging target and the biggest prize, more than half of energy consumption in Scotland generated by heat. Use of heat pump technology, for example, uh, like that developed, manufactured and exported by Star Renewables, already mentioned earlier by um, Morris Golden, um, will become the norm. Heat in homes and businesses, aided by an ongoing programme of energy efficiency measures driving a demand reduction of 20%. It's anticipated that 40% of energy for heat could come from renewable sources by 2030. All of these aspects of energy policy will feed into the Scottish Government's energy strategy, aligned closely with the Government's forthcoming climate change strategy, pointing the way forward for renewable energy use and for the boost to our economy from Scotland becoming a leader in the design, manufacture and export of these technologies. Uh, just before you begin, Mr Carson, um, I know we're all very, very keen to hear Mr Carson and, and the Minister in this debate, but we are running out of time. Uh, so I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3, and that allows us to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes, which you don't require to use, may I point out. So, <laughs> so may I invite Marie Todd to move a motion without notice. Moved. Thank you very much. Do members agree to extend the debate? And that's agreed then. I now call Mr Carson. Uh, many happy returns, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd also like to congratulate Marie Todd on securing the debate this afternoon and thank WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth uh, Scotland and RSPB for their report, which has been referred to in today's motion. Back in June 2009, this Parliament passed the Climate Change Scotland Bill with support from across the Chamber. The legislation was hailed as world-leading and demonstrated the Scottish Parliament's willingness to step up to the plate and show leadership by signing up to this ambitious target. I knew I shouldn't have extended all that time, no, was... <laughs> Mr Stevenson. No, it, it, it really just would be appropriate in the, the, the light of the remarks that are being made to recognise the leading role that our late friend Alec Johnson played from the Conservative benches uh, in that particular bill. I think it would be appropriate to recognise that, Presiding Officer. Well said, Mr Stevenson. Finlay Carson. Thank you for that. I appreciate that intervention. Uh, looking forward, as the report in question today does, there's still a lot more work to be done. And as was said when the legislation was going through Parliament, the challenge would not be in passing the bill, but other, rather in implementing it. One area that the, uh, the report focused on is heat, and it rightly states that the renewal of Scotland's heat infrastructure will help tackle fuel poverty by bringing down heating costs. Fuel poverty is a major issue, the effects of which are profound. At the moment, fuel poverty is defined as having to spend more than 10% of your household income on fuel. In order to address this, the Scottish Government aimed to eradicate fuel poverty by November 2016, which was last month. While I commend the Government's ambition, it's probably unlikely that the target will not be met, just as it wasn't met in 2015. Although there is a welcome decline of 4%, over 30% of the households were still fuel poor, and over 8% were living in extreme fuel poverty. These figures should all startle us. And although the causes of fuel poverty are varied and not always under our control, we are not powerless to act. 
At the election back in May, the Scottish Conservatives pledged to introduce a clear target to achieve a transformative change in energy efficiency across Scotland, with all properties achieving an EPCC rating or above by the end of the next decade at the latest. In Scotland today, a warm home should not be a luxury. People need help on how to make their homes warmer and get advice as to whether they're able to benefit from help with insulation and other efficiency measures and they should get in touch with the Home Energy Scotland hotline to do that. Another area that the report focuses on is transport, and I'd like to briefly touch on that. The report states that Scotland's low carbon transport sector needs to move up a gear to hit uh, climate targets. According to a Scottish Government publication looking at Scottish greenhouse gas emissions in 2014, domestic transport accounted for 22.8% of all emissions. The Committee on Climate Change suggested that there had been little progress in reducing emissions from transport, and I accept much of that is due to improved vehicle efficiency being offset by increased demand for travel as the economy has grown and fuel prices have fallen. But once again, more needs to be done to correct this lack of progress. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is, there is much more to discuss when it comes to climate change, and I do look forward, along with my colleagues, in participating in other debates on this topic. The Scottish Parliament passed world-leading legislation in 2009, and we all have a duty to do our bit to make sure we meet these targets set out in the bill. And as Liam touched on, research and development and innovation is going to play a large part of it. The mix of energy sources, whether that's wind or hydro, uh, will play a big part. And I'm delighted and I welcome the fact that uh, Kite Power Systems at West Frucht down in the, the southwest has uh, secured an additional five million pounds worth of funding from E.ON, uh, Schlonenberg and Shell Technologies to develop their test and research facilities uh, looking into kite power. They've already secured planning consent to deploy a 500 kilowatt power station and the additional uh, funding will lead to a multiple 500 kilowatt uh, systems in the next three or four years uh, with a three megawatt on onshore system uh, and an offshore system in the future. As the report states, there's no room for complacency on this subject, and in order to achieve our targets, we'll require bold policies, strong leadership, and concerted action, and I look forward to being part of that. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse to close this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you. happy birthday to you as well. And indeed, uh, I know you have a strong interest in this subject here uh, as well, so it's uh, very appropriate that you're here today. Um, I want to congratulate, as others have done, Marie Todd, on bringing forward an excellent uh, first member's business subject. It's one that's obviously very topical, and indeed, if uh, Marie Todd's uh, first speech as an opening on a member's debate is anything to go by, we we'll look forward to very good quality debates that she'll bring to this chamber in the future. Uh, but I'm glad there have been so many valuable and thoughtful, and indeed, positive contributions from right across the chamber today uh, and it has uh, would actually want to note as I think Stuart Stevenson and others have done uh, it's very welcome to see such positive contributions from the Conservatives uh, as well so uh, we've got a, a real um, alliance in this chamber on, on, on renewables that's so a very positive thing but uh, so soon as others appointed Mark Ruskell uh, after the debate we had only last week, I think it is good to have this subject in our minds as we come forward towards the draft energy strategy in the new year. And I do welcome uh, the debate around, uh, based around the work, as others have said, of WWF, Friends of the Earth, RSPB and, and Ricardo that we've discussed here today, because it does make a very strong and valued contribution to the debate around Scotland's energy future. Um, our manifesto um, did suggest that we would uh, give the 50 per cent target careful consideration i can promise that we are giving that careful consideration we are developing a draft strategy uh, members may not be surprised to understand that there's still a good bit of work to go i'm sure stuart stevenson will understand from his previous role um, that there's uh, the last few weeks are often the very intensive period when we are doing a lot of work but we are working very hard on delivery of the draft energy strategy i'm grateful for um, uh, members support from across the chamber last week for our continued commitment to the renewable energy sector and uh, members have raised some very valid points and I'll just touch on a few of them as I do just now. Uh, Claudia Beamish uh, talked about sort of energy democracy. I think that's a very uh, interesting uh, contribution to the debate. 
and uh, she asked reasonably about what we're doing to gather information from around the world. Uh, so we have um, uh, access to Climate Exchange, a consortium of uh, Scottish universities to provide us with research support, and they are uh, monitoring development of local and community energy projects for social and economic benefits around, around the world. Uh, they have uh, and can draw on experience uh, from outside the UK in doing so. And we're also funding Friends of the Earth Scotland to, to link uh, with and promote community shared ownership experience across Europe as well. So uh, we are not, um, not blind to the fact there may be good practice out there in the rest of the world we can learn from and take forward in our approach in Scotland. Um, Morris Golden, I think very reasonably, I'll come touch on it later, talked about heat and indeed Finlay Carson just finished on that subject and I will, I will come back to that uh, shortly. I think it is a very important area, 54% of energy consumption is in the form of heat, so they're right to highlight the importance of progress there, and indeed in transport as well. Uh, and we do accept there is more needs to be done if we're going to achieve our, our climate change targets uh, beyond 2020. I want to also pay tribute to Stuart Stevenson because he was, uh, I don't have many opportunities to do so, but I think today particularly, because the, uh, the, the minister who took the legislation to the parliament, I was incredibly proud when I was his successor to be able to speak about the achievement that Stuart and the team across the chamber had in having a universally uh, supported piece of legislation which is so unusual in a global context and in taking on such a, an important global challenge. Uh, Mark Ruskell uh, invited me to visit Fintry. I'd be more than happy to do so. I've, uh, I'm very aware of the very good work that's been done by the Fintry Development Trust, uh, but I'm keen to see for myself exactly the impact it's having and very interesting to hear about the embedded uh, renewable technology which is being, uh, he's seeing in his um, planning documents coming through uh, Stirling Council, uh, so that is useful to know. Um, Ruth McGuire uh, talked about the, um, the important local business like Windhoist um, and the work they're doing across the globe to install turbines and I'm certainly uh, keen to learn more about the business because the more I learn and about important local businesses in areas like Irvine who are involved in renewables, I can obviously push that message to uh, developers who are looking to invest in Scotland and indeed further afield. Uh, and Liam MacArthur uh, raised a very important point about the condition of the uh, technology we've invested in, in terms of the implementation of uh, our, our strategy on EV rollout. And uh, I clearly would look to, to find out more information about the condition of the equipment in Orkney and see if there's anything can be done to do that. Uh, I, I would have for the presenting officer. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. I mean, just to be clear, uh, the, the infrastructure in, in Orkney tends to be reasonably well um, maintained. Uh, actually, the problem is, is often on, on routes like the A9, where people are travelling large distances and, and re very much dependent on there being a rapid charge and uh, functioning um, at the point at, at which they need it. Paul. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Thank Liam MacArthur for that clarification. That will be very helpful in terms of uh, fine-tuning the approach I would take. I would just highlight uh, for members' benefit, uh, this is in the context of our current review of Switched on Scotland, which is the roadmap uh, that was developed jointly with industry uh, on the adoption of plug-in vehicles. So that is under review. So we can look at the issue about maintenance in the context of that. So it's helpful timing in that respect. But as has been well documented, um, Scotland's renewable energy industry is a UK success story, but it is also an area where Scotland has always shown great leadership and I welcome uh, the acknowledgement from, uh, from Morris Golden of that. Scotland met, as members have said, 57% of our electricity needs from renewables in 2015. And as Ruth McGuire highlighted, uh, in 2014, the low carbon and renewable energy economy supported 43,500 jobs, accounting for 9.7% of the total UK employment in the sector, which is higher than our population share, but not high enough. And I think the point about focusing on jobs, we need to uh, tie that in with our uh, emerging kind of industrial policy and manufacturing action plan to make sure we capitalise on the opportunities such as uh, I hope to see, as I'm sure members do, the rollout of all the phases of the Maygen project. I would like to see us work with Atlantis, see if there's opportunities to manufacture the turbines in Scotland and indeed other developments as they happen here as well. Um, as members have pointed out, £10.7 billion in turnover is a very significant contribution to our economy and last year did indeed see the largest increase in renewable heat output since measurement began. Uh, I do acknowledge the scale of challenge we've got to deliver on our, our targets, but I think you know, we should welcome the progress we've, we've made in recent years. And uh, you know, it's up from 3.8% in 2014 to 56 in 2015, so quite a large jump in the context of the challenge we face. And as Ivan McKee stated, uh, total Scottish renewable generation makes up approximately 26% of total UK renewables uh, at this moment in time. And uh, renewable electricity projects are estimated to have displaced over 13 uh, million tonnes of carbon dioxide across the UK in 2015. So it's clear that what once 
perhaps once regarded as a niche industry, is now very much mainstream and providing uh, very much valued jobs across the UK, but clearly, specifically in Scotland, we are keen to see that do more. And the Scottish Government's uh, targets, uh, which have been referred to by members, uh, are consistently supportive of renewable energy, uh, have, uh, and, and both those approaches of having ambitious targets and consistent support have been important factors in the success of the industry here. And uh, we also have made uh, a clear statement of political will uh, last week, as well as a chamber, in, in showing our support for the technology that we are referring to. WWF, Scottish Renewables, and all the organisations calling for an increased level level of ambition for renewables have recognised and welcomed the leadership and ambition shown by this Parliament as well as the Scottish Government. So I, I want to acknowledge the role of Parliament and this will hopefully continue as will the strongly collaborative approach to developing policies to achieve our shared objective of making the most of Scotland's renewables. Um, as we do prepare our energy strategy, we are looking closely to work closely with RSPB, WWF, Friends of the Earth, uh, and indeed uh, specialists such as Ricardo, because uh, there is much we can agree on, and we are making energy efficiency a very strong priority in that document, uh, as you will see in due course. Uh, certainly putting a lot of weight behind uh, SEEP, a coordinated programme to improve the energy efficiency of homes and buildings, and not just in the domestic sector, but non-domestic buildings as well, presiding officer. Uh, I do agree with Morris Golden about the, the issue of uh, low carbon heat. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep this brief, but the, um, we have uh, seen a very large increase in uh, the number of accreditations. As of the end of October 2016, there have been 10,703 accreditations for the RHI in Scotland, a 21% share of UK-wide uptake, so well above our pro rata share, so that's very encouraging as well. Um, I will come to an end, presiding officer, I think everyone's desperate to get away, but um, we are, uh, we've probably got Christmas parties and things to go to, I know my colleagues have, um, but I'm currently leading uh, this government work on the energy strategy. I look forward to working with all members of the chamber who, who bring positivity to that challenge, and I very much welcome again uh, today's uh, debate, and thank Marie Todd for bringing it to the chamber, and thank all members for their very positive remarks. Uh, because together we can, we can achieve great things for our renewable sector in Scotland. Thank you. I close this meeting.